I think it is not necessary here to step back into common security and defense policy. You know it well. I will try to set out from where we stand and to address some future aspects of it. And I would like to start with the institutional, some institutional impressions to lead over to our operational side, capabilities, and what the future might bring in terms of uh, challenges and how we should try to address this. To set the scene from the institutional point of view, I would like to remind you, and you mentioned it, it is very timely today, as we are on the day of the changing of commission, which for us being, as the EU military staff, part of the European External Action Service, is also the change of the High Representative. So Mrs. Mogherini is uh, taking over, and uh, her first announcement uh, to change the place of her office from the Capitol building to the Berlemont building can probably be significant. Um, we have certainly an impressive change and development ahead of us. I would say five years of the External Action Service so far is time for stock taking. I would try such a stock taking, not of course from an academic point of view, but from a practitioner's point of view. I was military representative also to the EU before that, and as was mentioned for 18 months now, the Director General of the EU military staff. And we can already now, and we witnessed it for the past few months already, a plethora of stock taking and recommendations to the new high representative. So I will not m join my voice to those because I will have very soon direct contact uh, with her team. But what is the overall picture? And I think for the past five years of the External Action Service and the more recent integration of the EU military staff into the service, we can certainly make some positive remarks. We have managed, in the spirit of the Lisbon Treaty, to insert the military dimension of the European Union into the external action of the Union. And not only formally and structurally, but also, to a degree, in the mindsets. Of course, I would not pretend that we have managed to integrate the military dimension into the strategic thinking of our numerous civilian counterparts as an axiom. But, far from this ideal case, we can be content with the possibility already now to increasingly influence all security-related analysis and planning processes. This is the case. And we have to work with the new team on the Commission side, with the new team of the High Representative to maintain and to exploit uh, this achievement. And I have to admit, to achieve this kind of integration is certainly easier in the external action service context than in the context of the European Commission. This is not only a question of size, 4,000 for the external action service, 30,000 for the Commission, but it is also a question of culture. Development, and even less humanitarian actors, use the prism of security policy as their trigger for analysis and as the guideline for their development of policies. Their action is determined by other criteria, which may at some distant point converge with security interests and security objectives. So at this stage, their action is not directly integrated with our security development. So here lies a challenge, and here lies a particular challenge for the new high representative, who is at the same time 
at the helm of the so-called RELEX cluster of commissioners. This is new. This is a real opportunity for the creation of a genuine comprehensive approach. I would say here that when I say genuine comprehensive approach, this goes beyond merely CIF mill interaction. <laughs> a real comprehensive approach for the European Union encompasses the entire tool set, and this includes the tool set available in the Commission. CIF mill is only available in the realm of CSTP. This is smaller. And having such a broader perception of comprehensive approach, approach would certainly in the future increase our flexibility and our reactivity to new situations. Of course, CIF mill relationship is part of it and is an important, very important theme which permeates uh, our action in the narrower circle of common security and defense policy. And mentioning this brings me to the question of command structures. As you are aware, currently we have two separate lines. We have civilian line with a permanent structure in Brussels, and we have a military line where the conduct, the command and control of operation lies outside the Brussels institutions. For the time being, there is no opening of this situation, but there are shades in development which can be used. And this is also something we will try to develop with the new high representative to see into possibilities to bring civilian and military conduct more closely together to the benefit of better synergies, of a better exploitation of synergies. The comprehensive approach is not only about overcoming stovepiped command structures, it is earlier in the analysis process about shared vision, shared objectives, shared planning, and shared measuring points. And this also needs to be developed, because if we really want to have CIF mill interaction, efficient CIF mill interaction, then we need common measuring points to the extent possible. We are not there yet, but I think the joint communication on the comprehensive approach, which was issued in the context of the European Council uh, last December, is very promising and is a very good starting point for further work in this direction. <coughs> to create now a bridge to some operational issue, I would also like to mention the dimension of time in the comprehensive approach. Addressing a crisis is not a one-off event. It has a duration. And when we speak about crisis management, we have a tendency to put, you know, you know probably these slides of decision-making processes where at the very beginning there is a big star or an eruption of a volcano, and here the crisis starts. But in real life, this is not the case. A crisis is lingering, and we probably, the European Union, are not the first actors to address such a crisis. And the CSTP will not be the first actors inside the EU. Development will be already there. So we have to insert ourselves the military actors in the common security and defense policy into this time frame. We are for the short, shorter and medium term action. And we have to find the right methods to transit towards the longer term, which needs the best appropriate instruments for financing. When it comes, for instance, to give you one example, to training of armed forces of third states of host nations, as Mali, for instance, then we have to ensure that our success lasts and is durable. And for that, it is not only enough to train, we have also to equip and we have to monitor over a longer time frame. This also needs to be developed. 
After this very short transition to the operational side, let me set out on operation to say what is the volume. The volume today is 10 civilian, five military operations and missions with an overall strength of 7,000 personnel, civilian and military abroad. Five military missions and operations with 3,000. Four of these military actions take place on the African continent. And I think there's a clear sign of the policy orientation of the European Union when it comes to external action. Africa plays a very important role here. You have the map. You see where we are. We are in the Horn of Africa. We are in the Sahel. And we are, most recently, and still for a short period of time, in the Central African Republic. Looking at this, this is CSDP. This is decision-making at 28. Not visible, because it is very difficult to visualize this. This is overlaid by a large network of EU member states' bilateral activities of all kinds in these countries, ranging from development to military presence and to military participation in other frameworks, like the UN as NATO. When we add up this other side of the picture, then we are in the tens of thousands of military personnel simultaneously deployed from EU member states. But it doesn't only mean that the number is much larger, but also the spectrum of military action is much broader. Because in these different environments outside the European Union Common and Security Defense Policy, states are acting in the entire spectrum from low level to high intensity conflict. <coughs> I repeat, this is not on the basis of decision making at 28, but from the outside, it is very frequently seen as European presence. When you ask Chinese diplomats, for instance, very frequently they say, but you Europeans, you are present there. You are acting here. Yes, not institutionally, but as European member states. Hence the interest, beyond common and security defense policy, to develop cap military capabilities of European member states in a way which allow also in the future to sustain that kind of activity, to sustain the entire and broad spectrum of military action. Coming back to, to CSDP, I have clearly to, to admit that military capabilities and uh, force structures are only one side of the coin of our action. The other is decision-making at 28. As long as there is no decision of 28 member states to act and a sufficient contribution, a sufficient buy-in from member states to contribute uh, to such an action, planning will remain an empty shell. And this is the day-by-day -day uphill struggle we, we have here. And this is always tinged with a degree of uncertainty. Uh, a good example is, for instance, our action in the Central African Republic, where we had a series of three very high-ranking decisions on rapid reaction with relation to the Central African Republic. When it then came to the question, how rapidly can we act? Yes, we did rapid planning. That was battle group speed, and then we were with force generation, which lasted six months, uh, uh, two months, uh, 60 days. So here is uh, certainly an area to be addressed. About the operational environment, our growing operational portfolio mirrors an increasingly volatile, complex, and unpredictable environment. In addition to current operations, we have to deal with a number of crises which are relevant to the EU's security. Our action is here more 
as military advisor to EU institutions than as strategic planners. To compensate to the extent possible the challenging character of the environment, we have to improve comprehensive situational awareness, reactivity and flexibility. And flexibility is certainly best addressed by a genuine comprehensive approach, as I described earlier. And in addition, we have to build partnerships. We have to build partnerships with third states, and we have to build partnerships with institutions. And I would highlight the example of the Central African Republic as a very illustrative one for our partnership with the United Nations. We are here in a transition phase. Our intention is to bridge towards a United Nations operation, which requires very close cooperation already now. This is the case. And I think uh, there is a very positive lesson to be drawn for the future. As for capabilities, my starting point would be, as you mentioned, the European Council of December 2013, which clearly underlines the need to improve the EU's capabilities to respond to the challenges I mentioned, particularly to cyber security, to maritime security, to space challenges, and a long list. It also very clearly emphasizes the need to improve the EU military rapid response through, to give examples, more flexible and more deployable EU battle groups. It called further on to cooperation deepen it co to cooperation with partners such as NATO, and with NATO particularly regarding the EU military capability development process and linked with the NATO defense planning process. In this broader context, the European Council reaffirmed its commitment to delivering key cap capabilities through a number of concrete projects organized by groups of member states as, we call it air pass, drones, remote pilotly air, air systems, satellite communication, cyber, air-to-air -air refueling. In the shorter term, I would in addition highlight from our staff's experience strategic capabilities as command and information systems, including their security against the, chi the cyber challenge, strategic air and sea lift, and last but not least, ISR in the broadest sense. When we talk about situational, comprehensive situational awareness, ISR is part of this. Intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. This is crucial. This is an element we will need also in situation where our action stops with prudent planning to inform prudent planning. And of course, it will be needed in situations where we go through uh, to more complex military action. From our observation, the general political intention to closely cooperate with NATO was clearly confirmed by the NATO-Wales summit, very explicitly. And it will remain an essential element on the way towards the EU security summit in 2015. In saying this, we have to keep in mind that 22 of our 28 EU member states are NATO full members, plus five who are partners. So you know all single set of forces. We have a responsibility vis-a-vis -vis our EU member states to help to support their defense planning and their force development so that it is compatible to the extent possible with NATO. And we, if you give a closer look on what capability development needs, meets concretely, it is very close 
There are, of course, elements which are more particular, more specific to the European Union. This relates particularly to the training area. Who says comprehensive approach needs comprehensive training, needs comprehensive awareness. So this is more EU-specific. In the context of capabilities, allow me two short vignettes on rapid response and on cyber in a few sentences. On rapid response, what was the challenge of the past years? So the overarching awareness is the battle groups were never used. There are several strands of potential reasons for that. What is pushed in the foreground very frequently is the financial reason. Certainly, there, it is an element of it, but it's also certainly not the only one. There is the perception that the battle group is never exactly suited to a given situation. Either it is too small, or it is too specific, or it is too large. Here I have to say very openly, we had a situation in the last autumn where we could have used the battle group as it stood, and we didn't. So we will, of course, continue in our planning, in our preparation to adapt, to make it more flexible. But we have to, take in, to keep in mind that there is also a very strong political dimension to it. And we have also to work on this political dimension. And the way we, from the military side, can try to contribute is information, is awareness, is participation in what is called the POLEX exercises, which are the preparatory, very high-level exercises of those nations who have the framework function in the battle group. So currently being prepared by Sweden for the Nordic battle group. Awareness. On flexibility, what we are preparing is to broaden the toolbox, to keep the battle group, but around it, to create joint instruments, naval, air assets, plus additional land assets, which can be plugged into a battle group, so to make it more flexible. This, of course, requires that member states are willing to provide these elements and then to use it politically when it comes to a battle group uh, deployment. Second vignette, cyber defense. From, it's a very large topic in the EU. It's, of course, overarching, uh, reaching into the Commission. From a military point of view, it is very much about protecting our systems. It is very much about protecting our chains of command, <coughs> creating awareness, and information exchange. The cyber defense, at least on the military side, very much depends on the willingness and the ability to exchange rapidly information about cyber incidents, to immediately draw lessons and to build the right tools to prevent such incidents. To conclude, I would say the list of risks and threats mentioned in the European Security Strategy from 2003 remains valid, but the list is growing. And these additional factors should be more concretely addressed on our way towards the Council 2015. And there are already indications in the Council conclusions of uh, 2013. The number and intensity of crisis in the immediate and more remote vicinity of Europe tends to increase. Also, to give you an example for this, the Ebola epidemic, which is now treated mainly as a humanitarian element, could turn into a regional security crisis if it is not sufficiently addressed. The growing dependence of Europe on free sea lanes, 90% of our trade goes through sea lanes, puts the issue of maritime security into the center. Maritime security will impact and continue to impact the global security framework. On the other side, 
another type and set of challenges is that the European Union is still reeling from the consequences of the economic and financial crisis. And reeling from is maybe to put it mildly. And all this had an impact on our armed forces, on the ability to rebuild capabilities and to create new capabilities. We also, to a degree, and here I'm encroaching into the purely political, but it is an observation, we have to deal with some political quarters reluctant to act in a European context. So we have to take this into account as well. In addressing these factors, we have to be aware that CSTP is just one tool in a much broader set of instruments for potential actions. But I would say that CSTP has sufficient visibility to make, its, to make its success a driver for further European engagement. But also the lack of success would lead to the contrary effect. What I would retain as key points which we should address immediately into the short and medium term future is to considerably improve our strategic communication about CSDP. We have weaknesses there. We should intensify our cooperation in capability development and training. We should better identify those areas of cooperation and interaction which, with NATO where most added value can be expected. We should improve our instruments with a particular focus on situational awareness and rapid reaction. We should continue to build a genuine comprehensive approach from the definition of interest to the most appropriate chains of command for CSTP operations and missions. And we should build on and expand the pattern of multinational cooperation which already function well. For instance, multinational headquarters or multinational capabilities. Let us continue this and build on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.